You ready? Okay, here we go. Good morning. Welcome to First United Methodist Church in Humboldt this Sunday morning. Um, my name is Pam Dietz. I will be the Sunday school teacher for this next series of lessons. Um, and we're starting a new series, and today's uh, focus is on the spiritual practice of hospitality. And it looks at the various ways the Bible makes clear that we all belong to God. So as I begin, I want you to remember when you were in high school. Um, some time ago, a movie came out called Mean Girls, and it was kind of eye-opening for me because it reminded me of when I was in middle school and high school, and I was like, wow, this is, this is what it was like for me. In the Mean Girls movie, there's a cafeteria scene where a new student is brought into the cafeteria and shown where each of the different cliques sit. There's the freshmen, there's the seniors, there's the ROTC people, there's the preppy people, the jocks, there's the arty people. Um, everybody wants to belong. Everybody wants to find a group of people that they fit in with, that they can surround themselves and go through life with. Maybe that's an inherent need in our makeup. But everybody wants to fit in. Everybody wants to belong. Everybody wants to be in community. And that's kind of what we're talking about today. Have you ever gone to a new church, moved um, to a different city, a different location, had to find a new church? And when you walk in, you kind of feel like you're in a wilderness. Where do I sit? Who will talk to me? What is the service going to be like? What is the atmosphere here? What are these people? Will they like me? And it's kind of the same thing. Um, in biblical times, it was customary for people to open their homes to travelers. Uh, in Jeremiah, he was a prophet to the Israelites. He was told to prophesy to the Israelites about their upcoming exile. And they were to be exiled as punishment for their unfaithfulness, their unwillingness to be obedient to God's commands. Not only were they to be exiled in a strange land, but they were told to show hospitality to the people that they would be living among, their, captor, their captors, the enemy, if you will. So this is kind of, this is still hospitality, but it's in a reverse situation. Here is the stranger offering hospitality to the people who live there. In biblical times, people traveled only when necessary. They didn't have a holiday inn down the road. They didn't go away for a long weekend. Most people had a nomadic lifestyle, and they traveled with their tents, their flocks, their people, looking for food, looking for work. Um, there were no hotels or restaurants, no entertainment along the way. Travelers depended on the hospitality of the people that they met. And at that time, if well, it's kind of the same today, if a stranger comes up and knocks on your door, you know, your first thought is, do I need to get a gun? Do I need to call the police? Who are you? I don't know who you are. Why are you knocking on my door? And it was kind of the same then. But what was interesting is there was an unwritten rule or law that most people followed, which was, if I offer you hospitality, if I bring you into my home and I give you uh, food and a place to wash and a bed to sleep in, then you won't harm me. And likewise, the traveler would accept these things from their host and in return would not harm their host. So it was kind of an exchange, if you will, and they respected that towards each other. And maybe the guest would be there for a few days. Um, after a long time, the host would say, you know, it's, you've been here long enough, it's time to go. But he would say, you've been here a while, can I offer you a job? Do you need work? Maybe he would say, this other person needs some work. Maybe you could go work there. Maybe you could go stay there. But there was still kindness and hospitality and welcome there. Uh, one of the best examples is Abraham. 
in Genesis 18, 1 through 8, um, this is when the birth of Isaac was promised. The Lord appeared to, Ar to Abraham and while he was sitting in the tent door in the heat of the day. And when Abraham looked up, he saw three men standing in the distance. And when he saw them, he ran to them. And he said, come on, come stay with me. He bowed down with his face to the ground. And he said, please stay. Don't pass by. Let me bring you some water. Let me wash your feet. Here, lie down here and rest comfortably under this tree. I will bring a piece of bread to refresh and sustain you, and then you may go on. And they replied, do as you've said. So Abraham went into the tent to Sarah, and he said, quickly, get ready. Three measures of fine meal. Knead it. Bake cakes. He got a calf, and he gave it to the butcher to be prepared. And he had curds, and he milked. And he did all these things for strangers that were passing by. What's interesting about this is that in Hebrews 13, 2, the author says, don't neglect to open up your homes to guests, because by doing this, some have been host to angels without knowing it. And these three were angels or messengers from God sent to tell Abraham, your son will come. You will, the promise will be fulfilled. Likewise, later on, um, a few years later, Laban extended the same hospitality to Abraham's servant who came looking for a wife for Abraham's son. And, and there was no message sent ahead, hey, get ready, I'm coming. It was just, he, <clears throat> pardon me, he showed up. And as he was there, Laban said, here, come in. Here, I've got a place in, in my house for you. I've got this place here for your camels. Uh, he unbridled the camels, he fed them, he offered to wash the man's feet, and he set out a meal. And this story is in Genesis 24. In Exodus 22:21, God says to the Israelites, don't mistreat or oppress an immigrant because you were once immigrants in the land of Egypt. So as they traveled through the land, they experienced hospitality from the people they were around. They had a firsthand experience of what it was like to be a stranger in a strange land. <clears throat> when Jesus sent his disciples to proclaim God's kingdom, he sent them out with nothing. No walking stick, no bag, no bread, no money, not even an extra shirt. Whatever house you enter, remain there until you leave that place. And if they don't welcome you, then as you leave that city, shake the dust off your feet as a witness against them. So Jesus, this is, this is Old Testament to New Testament, this traveling and offering hospitality to people. So now that we've had that brief hospitality introduction, if you will, I'd like you to pray with me. Dear Heavenly Fathers, we come before you to study this lesson I ask you to help us understand in our hearts what your hospitality means, how to extend that to strangers, how to be the welcoming hand to somebody that does not know you, to make somebody comfortable enough that they would want to come with us to worship you, to learn more about you. Thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. So, if you're not aware of what's been going on in the world, we're in the middle of a pandemic. Maybe it's getting better. I hope so. I'm going to think positive thoughts about what the future of this is. Um, I don't want to live in fear. But something that we have experienced in our church, as I look around the sanctuary for the Sunday school lesson, there are very few people here. And during our worship sessions, there are very few people here. People are watching online. And that's good. I think we need to adapt to the changes. But there are a lot of our members that are afraid to come to church because they're afraid to be exposed, and I don't blame them. But the end result of this is isolation. Very similar to being exiled. We have become a church of isolated people. We are 
in our own exile, alone. We are separated from each other, but God is still with us. And maybe if we can take a minute and think about how that has been feeling, we might have some idea of how the Israelites felt when they left Jerusalem and were forced to go to Babylon. One of my favorite movies was The Sound of Music. And if you'll remember, um, Maria is a young, uh, she's not a nun yet, but she wants to become a nun. But really, she's just a young girl that has lost her family, and now she's in this abbey, and it's the only home she knows. And the, the mother superior, in her wisdom, sends her out to be uh, a governess to Captain Von Trapp for his seven children. And she went, but it didn't go well, and she returned to the abbey. And she felt like she had been exiled. She was a stranger there. She did not belong there. That was not where she wanted to be. But she was sent back to make the best of it. And she did. She made the best of it. She served the the family well, and you know, they fell in love, and they all lived happily ever after, maybe. But Maria was in exile, and she still went back and offered her best to the people, the native people, if you will. The people of Judah experienced exile as a nation, and they were forced to leave the land of promise and move to Babylon. Once again, they had to travel through the wilderness to a place they did not want to go. And we're still doing that. Whether it's because we have to move to a new city for a new job, find a new church, find new schools, find new friends, because we're isolated uh, from this pandemic. But whatever the reason is, we're kind of in that same spot. God told the people of Judah, promote the welfare of the city where I have sent you into exile which is completely the opposite. Why would the stranger promote the welfare? Why would the stranger offer hospitality? It should be the other way around. The city needs to be offering it to the stranger, but God has reversed this as he often does. So thinking about us now, who are the strangers that we meet during these times of exile? Who are the people that we need to offer hospitality to, and how do we do that? Jeremiah was the son of Hilkiah. He was one of the priests at Anathoth in the territory of Benjamin, and the word of the Lord came to him in the thirteenth year of the reign of Josiah, son of Ammon, king of Judah, and through the reign of Jehoiakim son of Josiah, king of Judah, down to the fifth month of the eleventh year of Zedekiah, son of Josiah, king of Judah, when the people of Jerusalem went into exile. Jeremiah was God's prophet. He was young, and initially when he was called to be a prophet, he told God, I'm too young, I don't know anything. God said, I will tell you what you need to say. During the 40 years leading up to Judah's exile in Babylon, Jeremiah was there trying to get them to turn around, to live the right way, to do the right thing. And these 40 years leading up to their exile reminds us of Israel's wandering for 40 years. So it's a similar wilderness experience. There were three main things that Jeremiah was trying to get across in this letter that he wrote to the king. Do what is right and just. Help the oppressed, the refugees, the orphans and widows and strangers, and you will suffer loss if you disobey this call for social justice and hospitality. And God instructed Jeremiah to deliver this message to the king. And it was not gonna be well received, but he did. 
So Jeremiah 22, this is what the Lord says, do what is just and right. No questions, no ifs, no contingencies. Do what is just and right. Rescue from the hand of the oppressor the one who has been robbed. Remember, these are people in a strange land. This is not their homeland. Do no wrong or violence to the foreigner, even though they were foreigners, the fatherless or the widow, and do not shed innocent blood in this place. And if you want to take a minute and think about it, these people that I've just listed are the most vulnerable in our society today as well. They are the ones who have no safety net. The widows, the children, the fatherless, the foreigner that doesn't speak our language. They have no safety net. And if we walk by and don't help when we can, as we can, then we are guilty. For if you are careful to carry out these commands, and here's the promise, if you are careful to carry out these commands, then the kings who sit on David's throne will come through the gates of the palace, riding in chariots and on horses, accompanied by their officials and their people. In other words, Jerusalem will be restored. If you are careful to carry out these commands. But if you do not obey these commands, declares the Lord, I swear by myself that this palace will become a ruin. And they did not obey. And Jerusalem and the temple were defiled and torn down and ruined. This is the focus of the letter, Jeremiah 29, verse 1. This is the text of the letter that the prophet Jeremiah sent from Jerusalem to the surviving elders among the exiles. And the exile happened in stages. So there are people that came first, and this was the first king, Jehoiakim. And then there were people that came in a second wave, and this was with Zedekiah, who was the king of Jehoiakim. This was after Jehoiakim and the queen mother and the court officials and the leaders and the skilled workers had gone into exile. So this is the letter he wrote after the first exile. He entrusted the letter to Elsaha, Shaphan, and Gemariah, son of Hilkiah. And they sent this letter to King Nebuchadnezzar in Babylon. This is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, God is reassuring these people, the exiles, that he is still with them. He is still their God. And he says to them, he says to all I carried into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon, this is what the Lord Almighty, God of Israel, says to all those I carried into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. Now, did you get this? God sent them into exile. God is claiming responsibility. <clears throat> he used the Babylonians to punish the Israelites for their sins. And I know that if we look back through the stories in the Old Testament, this is a pattern that repeats over and over. And, and to be honest, don't we still today do this? We promise we will do what we're supposed to do that we will live the way God wants us to live, that we will do what is right and just in his eyes. And then we go our merry way and do what we feel like doing. And then we have a consequence or a punishment, and we come back around. So these are the words of God to the exiles. Build houses. Settle down. Plant gardens. Eat what you are producing from your garden. Marry, have sons and daughters. Find wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage so that they too may have sons and daughters. Increase in number there. Do not decrease. This is not go into hiding in Babylon and gather the caravan around you and protect yourself. This is go. Make a family, make a life, make a home, have children, have grandchildren, increase in number. Does this remind you of anything? 
maybe in Egypt, when after a time the Israelites increased in number so greatly that the Egyptians were afraid of them. Go increase in number there. Also, seek the peace and prosperity of the city, Babylon, to which I have carried you into exile. You want me to, to do what? You want me to be nice to these people that have captured me? You want me to seek their prosperity? What is good for them? I need to be having a campaign to undermine them. I need to be setting up spies to figure out how we can bring about their downfall. But that is not what God has said. Pray to the Lord for it, for Babylon, because if it prospers, here's his promise. If it prospers, you too will prosper. Yes, this is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel says, do not, and hear me, do not let the prophets and diviners among you deceive you. Do not listen to the dreams you encourage them to have. They are prophesying lies in my name. And this is happening today. The church is being subverted by people claiming that they are telling you what God has said. God came to me in a dream and he told me to tell you. We need to be careful who we listen to and what words they're saying to us. We need to check everything by the word of God. Just because it sounds good or because it seems right does not mean it's right. Hananiah was a prophet of Israel prior to the exile who said, it's going to be okay, my friends. It's all good. We're going to go for a couple weeks and then we'll come back to Jerusalem because God told me that. Don't worry about it. You don't have to change the way you're living. It's going to all be okay. This is just a temporary setback but it was 70 years, it was not a couple weeks. Hananiah was a false prophet. Sometimes we don't wanna hear the hard truth. We don't wanna see the reality of the situation. We need to accept responsibility for our actions, our choices, our behavior. And I'm not saying we need to go stand on a platform somewhere and tell the world everything we've done wrong, but we do need to come before God and confess our sins and get right with God and then go take care of his people. So in verse 10, this is what the Lord says, when 70 years are completed, and 70 years can be thought of as a lifetime, my life, my children, and my grandchildren. When 70 years are completed for Babylon, I will come to you and fulfill my good promise to bring you back to this place, back to Jerusalem. Jeremiah 25, 12 says, When the 70 years are over, I will punish the king of Babylon and his nation for what they have inflicted on you. So God is telling them they're not going to get away with this. They've done wrong too, and they will be punished. But everything needs to be in my time, in God's time. And here's the promise, and a lot of people claim this promise for their lives. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. Then you will call on me and come and pray to me, and I will listen to you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. I will be found by you, declares the Lord, and bring you back from captivity. I will gather you from all the nations and places where I have banished you, declares the Lord, and will bring you back to the place from which I carried you into exile. Now he's talking about the Hebrew nation right here. When the Israelites were in the wilderness after they had left Egypt, and Moses went up on the mountain to receive the law from God. The first thing they did was take all their gold and make an idol because they forgot. So quickly they forgot what God had done for them and how he had brought them out of Egypt. And this is God reminding them, don't do that. 
Even though you may not feel like I am with you, I am. I have not left you. Even though you have left the place where I was living, the temple, I am still with you. I am still listening to you. This first promise is that God would be present for them, with them. And the second was that he would end their captivity. He is still thinking about their future. When the 70 years are over and they return to Jerusalem, the children and the grandchildren of the exiles would return with stories from their parents of the former glory of the temple, and they could rebuild. So this is God's promise to the Israelites for peace, for presence, and hope for the future. And he promises the same to us today. So I want you to take just a minute and think about this. What do God's promises of peace mean to you? What kind of peace do you need in your life? Do you need the peace that comes from knowing God is with you even in the midst of this pandemic? The peace of knowing that God is walking with you through the trials of this life? What does this promise of presence mean? Even when you walk away, even when you turn your back and you leave the church, God has not left you. All you need to do is turn around. And finally, what does God's promise of hope mean? This world is not our home. As wonderful as I find it and as much as I enjoy living in it and doing all the things with family and children. This is not my home. And my hope is the promise from God that I will be in heaven with him after I die. So just for a minute, think about this. If this world is not our home, we are strangers here. And just like the Israelites, we need to show hospitality to everybody here, all the people. If you will, pray with me. Lord God, thank you for opening your heart to us. When the world is a cold and lonely place, your acceptance and forgiveness warms us. As you have loved us, let us so love the strangers in our midst. May they find in us generous, trusting friends. It's in Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen.